This is iFanboy Pick of the Week, number 728, brought to you by iFanboy listeners just like you. Hello, welcome to iFanboy Pick of the Week. This is episode 728. I am Josh Flanagan. I'm here with my co-host, Connor Kilpatrick. Hello. Later, we will be joined by our third hetero life mate triumvirate, Ron Richards, to talk about G.I. Joe. But that is not now. Yeah. That is not now. Now, we are iFanboy. We read comics. That's our job. And there were some comics to read. We also yeah. picked some others out. And and we will try to be normal uh, in the face of not normalcy, which is often where entertainment comes from, I have found. It's where innovation li- lives. It's, it is. I know. <laughs> we're going to... Um, not to say this is, will be in any way innovative. We're going to disrupt our specific podcast industry. Right. That's what we're going to do. Disrupt our own show. What we will not do is hold back from spoiling things, unless, of course, we decide to. Here's a spoiler warning. We are going to be talking about a... 38 year old comic book so probably <laughs> you're gonna have to go ahead and take that as it comes yeah that's the deal this week connor has the pick but before we get to that mm. connor what hurts i have uh, uh you'll you'll know what i'm talking about i've got a tendon in my thumb oh my god it has popped up over the last couple of years the first time it did they gave me the stretches and i did those and it went away and, mm-hmm. and then i use one of those grip strengthener things which helps okay Yep. And then, uh, you know, about a week ago, it was like, hey, I'm back. And so if I move my thumb the wrong way, I, I, it hurts until I do the stretches and everything. Oh, huh. huh. yeah. I've been there. Yeah. I've, uh, I've, you know not, what? I was not quite as bad gonna... as your thumb thing. No, I had the surgery for well. my thumb thing. And I, it was actually a wrist thing at the base of the thumb. Right. But uh, it all hurt. But it's important is that my, my thing today was going to be same thumb, left side, where I had the surgery left, a little further thumb. up. Left thumb. Yeah. The, uh, the joint where the base of the thumb, not the one in the wrist, but the top part, every once in a while it gets cranked to the side mm-hmm. by something, by life, and then when that happens, it hurts for like two months. And this must have happened a couple of days ago because if I just like hit it the wrong way on something, it's excruciating pain for a little bit until it heals. I think I went to, the first time I went to like press a button on the remote control and it felt like someone stabbed me in the wrist and I was like, ah, <laughs> it hasn't been as bad. <laughs> I've been trying to be, be good about keeping it is, strong. Is that De Quervin's? Is that how this? Because that's what they thought I had. Oh, my doctor just listened to what I said, looked at it, felt my wrist, and said, "Just do this stretch." And it, uh-huh. I did that, and it basically moving your thumb to your pinky, to the okay. base of your pinky. That stretched it out, and then again, strengthening actually really helped. And so the, to continue this, because I'm yeah. sure people are turned <laughs> off because it's fun. The forearm muscle up from there, often you'll find that's very tight, and that will hurt. That. Oh yeah, I had tennis elbow in my right arm. Yeah couple years ago which was it, it local <laughs> the pain localizes in your elbow but it's actually from uh, a tendon injury yeah. lower in your forearm now connor I'm, i i really don't mean to be pedantic on you but this is what hurts this is not yeah. what used to hurt and i, I need, I'm <laughs> need sorry. to stay i need you to stay focused that's for later in the show what used to hurt yeah i mean we'll see we'll see how this content my gets. pride the pick of the week <laughs> the pick of the week was as uh 1982's Marvel Superhero Contest of Champion, three-issue miniseries, a uh, story by Bill Mantlo and Mark Grunewald uh, champions, with Stephen Grant. Champions, come on. I'm there's, sorry. There's multiple champions here. Don't integrate there, them all. That's a very true thing. The art here is by John Romita Jr., a young upstart John Romita Jr., uh, and Bob Layton on uh, finishes and some of the other art, and uh, Pablo Marcus on uh, inks along with uh, Bob Layton as, as earlier well, described. Well, Bob Layton, let's – yeah, I mean not to – you keep reading. The I know you mean. Keep reading the hundred people who, wrote, who worked on the book, yeah. and we'll get to it. Colors all over the map, but they all look the same. So we've got uh, <laughs> Andy Yank. Yank. I don't know these. Yank. We're doing new names. This is great. Yankus. Yanchus. Patricia DeFalco. Clearly, some sort of connection to Tom DeFalco, the editor and, and somewhat scripter of this. Michelle Wolfman, Christy Steele, Don Warfield, and Carl Gafford. They remain very consistent in their coloring, and of course, Joe Rosen on colors. Who just it sounds. He sounds like a colorist. Yeah. Letters. Yeah. letters. Letter. When we're going to program the show, we don't, you know, with no new books, it's always an interesting process to figure out what we're going to talk about. And so I was looking through Comicsology for a book to download to talk about. And I, I wanted to find a Marvel book because we did a bunch of DC books or non Marvel books. And I, I came across Contest of Champions and I was like, you know what? I've never actually read Contest of Champions. And it's one of the more famous Marvel stories. It, it spawned a whole video game franchise. I've never actually read it. It's like a title I'm more familiar with than yeah. anything else about. And it turned out to be really an interesting story and an interesting place in the sort of the history of Mar- you know comics. It's Marvel's very first miniseries, 
Really? According to the really fascinating essay in the back from Tom DeFalco. Yeah, I did read that, but I don't know I clicked on that part. That's good. If you think about it, so 82 is about 20 years after the Marvel Universe is born, the modern Marvel Universe is born. So It is 20, yeah. It, it, we'll get to the story, but in the story itself, you have a lot of these characters meeting for the first time, which I thought was fascinating. As opposed to, by the way, 20 years ago now was 2000. <laughs> right. Shh. Shh. And so what was really interesting was that Contest of Champions started off as a, as a one-shot treasury edition book that was going to be a tie-in to the Olympics. And then in 1980, the U.S. pulled out of the Olympics. We could the protest the Soviet Union. So they had to scramble, and they killed the book, but no one told the inker, Pablo Marcos, who had all the pages, and was just inking them down in South America. What was interesting about that story was he was down in South America, and then the way that Tom DeFalco describes it is... One day, Pablo showed up in the office. I was like, he traveled with, with all eight the, pages yeah. from South America to New York, and they didn't know he was coming. Right. I don't know. It's the wild and woolly days of comics yeah. in the 80s. And so he shows up in the office with all these inked pages, about half the pages of, from the story. 40 pages out of a 72-page story, I think. And they were like, oh, shit. Whose job was it to tell him the book was canceled? <laughs> and so... So Mark Grunewald, the assistant editor, said, hey, uh, what if we took these pages, rewrote them into a miniseries, and did that? And they were like, cool. And so that's what this is. And so it explains a lot of the weird story elements. Bob Layton came along and had to redraw things that were no longer consistent with Marvel. So over the course of a couple of years, I think right. the characters had changed costumes or they were no longer alive. So they had to redraw them. So he, Bob Layton's artist ink and credit is for his own work, which was redrawing panels of characters who needed to be redrawn touch up continuity art kind right of thing. and then they sort of re reworked it into a miniseries and then of course there's a giant continuity problem i think this is a fascinating mess i really 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 enjoyed reading it because it's a really great era of marvel it's a mess yes. the con the story is a mess but to me it's sort of an, an endearing mess because they were trying to salvage this thing out of yeah. out of nothing like we don't want to throw away 40 pages of work and so they just sort of had to sort of tie together the story that was meant to be something else into this new thing. And then at the very end, they fucked it up, <laughs> which led, <laughs> by the way, to a sequel, which happened in the pages of two annuals uh, in like 87, which was one of my all time favorite Marvel stories. So that's partially why I loved this so much is because it set up that story. I finished this and I was like, you couldn't put that in this edition? No, it's in a different edition, which it wasn't on a comicsology. If, if it was, I would have chosen that one it's i was really upset i remember reading that those issues as a kid and being like oh this story is great and it was great so i want to talk about the book itself what's mm -hmm. in it as this thing and and what's interesting is that i saw that thing that uh you're talking about there's a big mistake we'll get to yeah. it and i went that seems weird but i didn't go back which you <laughs> wouldn't have then you wouldn't have gone back and I mean, somebody would have i'm sure but i, I didn't let it you know, well, he said, he, he said they got a ton of letters about it. Yeah, I'm sure they did, but yeah. you know, really, comics fans tend to be pedantic. Yeah. However, I just want to put a pin in this idea. Yeah. When we talk about this, and then we talk about some of the books we're talking about later, I've I've been working over something in my head. Okay. The unifying theory of comics. Oh boy. Mixing that in with the super god stuff that have affected me, and we're going to get to that. It should be noted that this entire episode is basically brought to you by the early '80s and the search for various items across the globe in small teams. I was not unaware of the facts. So, the basic story is this. <laughs> All So also, as should be, should be noted before, one more thing historically, it's widely acknowledged that Secret Wars was the first crossover, which happens, I think, three years after this book. That long? Yeah, and then Crisis happens a year later. Those are like the first right. two official crossovers. But this was the first story that featured all of the characters from the universe together in one story. Now, most of them are just there, not doing anything, but they're all in the story, especially the first issue, which takes the, almost the entire first yeah. issue just to gather everyone together. But this is the first time, and I can't imagine as a kid reading this, where everyone is in this book. Yeah. Must have blown their minds. Whoever owns the double-page spread. <laughs> right. That's on page 14, where, yeah. where, who is it? It's Beast in big letters. Where the heck are we? Yeah. Like, that is probably a holy grail of original art. Right. Anyway, so the beginning starts out that all of the superheroes, literally, are, you know, going around on Earth, 
and doing their thing. And we see a bunch of scenes of them getting surrounded by this reddish energy and then disappearing. Uh, you know, we've got we've got the workout room of the Avengers. We've got the Fantastic Four at a dinner. We've got then we start going international. We see the Argentinian superhero and Sunfire in Japan and, and uh, you know, the British Captain Britain and, and Black Knight and the Inhumans and all this stuff. And they're transported into this giant makeshift stadium that has been put up in space in they orbit. They had Cobra build it for them. You know what? Their their infrastructure work. <laughs> we have to get to that later. I'm sorry. <laughs> and in there is our two magical characters, one who would later be portrayed in a very different light by Jeff Goldblum. And I had to check that. I was like, wait, that's the same? Yes, it is. So uh, we have the Grandmaster, yep. uh, who's into games uh, on a cosmic level, and the Unknown, a hooded, cloaked, mysterious figure who a Titan would later have a real big crush on. Right. And they say, hey, we have to reanimate my dead brother uh so i've got a bet with this other person says the grandmaster his dead brother is the collector Mm -hmm. and again just in case you're not this was uh he was portrayed by benicio del toro in the marvel movies and guardians of the galaxy so if that's sort of putting it into this stuff does exist in the marvel cinematic universe context we got a contest there are four things on earth we're going to make two teams if the grandmaster's team went by the way four things on a contest doesn't make any sense no you need you need to have it so it can't be a tie yes that's true so they have all the superheroes, and this was actually a disappointing part to me, is they they put all the superheroes together, and then they just took a handful of them. I think it's 12 per team, yeah. and I was like, oh. And also, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and tell you who's on each team. Well, hold on. Before uh, we get to that. Okay. So on that page you mentioned, page 14 on your digital reader, the double page spread, are there 3,000 superheroes on Earth? Because that page seems to imply such. Or are those all just in humans in the back? Because they're in this giant arena... And in the foreground is all these characters we recognize and you know all these heroes we recognize. And then there's just there's just a sea of little heads in the back. I like, love that though. I just think it's I was like, who are all these people? I, well, I mean, I like, but I didn't know. I can't think of his name, but the you know the Argentinian champion, and there's right. all the Russian people. And I like the idea that they were thinking that, you know, outside of the standard people we know, there's all sorts of other people we don't talk about in other places. Yeah. This it, the, a, a theme in this whole thing was a very antiquated sense of internationalism. Well, that's, what that comes to the Olympics part. So you can clearly, right. it was, um, I and mean, Josh is going to talk about the lineups in a second, but this is, you know, if you're, if you're the collector, I'm not collector, if you're the grandmaster and you're picking your team of heroes from the Marvel Universe to win this contest, there was some bizarre choices in the context of the story, unless you realize it was, it's a distinctly international team, yeah. specifically because it was written to be an Olympics Tribute to the Olympics. So, you know, why would you pick Shamrock when Thor has not been chosen? I actually don't think I had realized that. I think that's correct. And and it's funny. I'll read the team off in a second. But uh, the other thing I was going to say, though, while it's clearly I think that their hearts are in the right place in like sort of putting all these other characters in, there is an enormous amount of what we would consider to be cultural insensitivity now. (laughs) Like it is the base level stereotype of all of them their german character they specified as west german is named blitzkrieg and i was like nope <laughs> nope you're not doing that it, it goes on and on like that i thought that the uh, the chinese one the collective yeah i was like it's kind of clever but also like he summons the power <laughs> of the power all of, the of all the people, people of china yep. which is kind of clever but also i felt a little uncomfortable about a lot of those i mean there was a lot of interesting dynamics you had the israeli hero sabra and then you Uh had the muslim hero arabian knight who are on the same team and so there's conflict there and then there's shamrock and captain britain i didn't expect that level of and it wasn't like a deeply penetrating look at these conflicts but i didn't expect that level of story in this kind of thing there was also an aboriginal character and there was Kind of a shocking amount of uh, sensitive, not sensitivity, but like his knowledge about it. like he wouldn't give his real name because in names have power and like the, the Aboriginal uh, uh, culture is kind of fascinating and, and sort of how different. And like there was some of that there, I thought. And that was really interesting. There was, and there was, I mean, as full of cultural stereotypes as this was, and it totally was, there was, there was also a, a level of equal rights for women at least. Because there was, that. There, was, there was a bunch of chauvinist characters and the female characters were like, go fuck off, like She-Hulk and like Miserable Woman. And they were, you know, like, so there was there was at least some attempt to examine that. Yeah, I think the writers were pretty 
progressive for the time, but it's interesting for to see how it sort of sure. changed. Yeah, and you see, like, like Wolverine just will not stop calling the French character Peregrine a frog. And I was like, <laughs> it's just, you, come on, man. Anyway, so the, the, the lineups are, and I think that one of these is stacked more powerfully than the other, is uh, Captain America. Oh, uh, who's the original character's name? I forget. Talisman. Right. There's the Russian character Black Star, I believe. Yes, Black Star. Captain Britain, Wolverine. Uh, the Argent the Argentinian who the Argentinian looks like a conquistador. Just well, the Argentinian so. who in the middle of the story became Brazilian and then went back to being yes, Argentinian. he did. <laughs> That's true. We complain about continuity now. Sasquatch, of course, uh, from Canada. She Hulk, Daredevil, Peregrine of France, the Thing. And oh, oh, that's Blitzkrieg. Blitzkrieg, yeah. Blitzkrieg the, the West German character. Now that's a pretty powerful team between the thing, Sasquatch, and Captain America and Wolverine. And Captain Britain too. Yeah, like that's a that's a loaded team. Yeah. Then you go over to the other side, and what's funny? There's a Russian on each team. Yeah. So before well, the boycott, yeah. I know. Before the boycott, they were trying. You have Iron Man. What's the Russian's name? Russian Thor. Russian Thor. That works. He's got a hammer. Shamrock. Who I'm almost offended of but just by looking at. <laughs> Iron Fist, Storm, Arabian Knight, Angel, Sabra, the Israeli Hero. superheroine. And I believe like a Sabra is a, a fruit or a vegetable. It's a spiny. Now it's a hummus brand. Right. But, but like, she said the story. It's like a, it's a spiky pear or something like that. Yeah. Uh, Invisible Woman, Black Panther, Sunfire, and The Collective. From China, yeah. Now – on a strength standpoint, these two teams are not equal. <laughs> yeah. But you've got some powerful people on, uh, you know, like uh, Invisible Woman. At this point, was she considered to be one of the more... I don't remember how much they'd expand on her powers. I was just really surprised that in 1982, they didn't mm -hmm. work Spider-Man in it, because he was still sort of the flagship character at that point. It's I mean, he still is, but he was like... Fairly, of popu yes. Popularity, he was still, you know, one of those popular. So it was interesting that he wasn't even in this... He was only there to... Briefly get hit on by Spider Woman, and then that was it. Oh yeah, there was there was two panels where he had something to do. Spider Woman in her excellent costume, by yeah. the way. So they, you know, then they just go around the, you know, they break up into smaller groups and they go around the world. And then there's like each chapter has a different configuration. And, you know, they struggle over, gather these quarters of the Golden Globe. What happens is that the editorial team fucks up and scores it wrong. <laughs> they so they score it was it three to one Grandmaster. Started three to one, and just before that, you had seen them tie it up two to two. Yeah, so the actual score was two to two, but editorially they fucked up, and that's how that was the excuse they used for the sequel was that the contest wasn't actually over. It's a fascinating look, and this is a great time, especially for the Avengers. That opening sequence when they're training is was like gold for me. Why is the Vision jogging with Iron Man? With Iron Man, neither of them. But I mean, like Iron Man at least could be moving his body in there. The Vision needs no exercise, does he? <laughs> I don't know. Is that how that works? I don't think mechanical muscles atrophy. I think he just, maybe, he's I mean, always strong. Why jog? He is a synthesoid. I don't know. So maybe he spends all that time being uh, of a low mass. You can see how this story would have played out in an Olympics contest. Because it, it was as much about cultural integration between these characters and, and learning about these, these international heroes as it was about anything else. And it was interesting. I mean, it's not the Ramita anyone's used to now. It's, it's I, him at a style that's... It's more similar to his dad's than, than what he's yeah, doing I mean, now. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I actually, at first I was reading it, and I don't think I had noted. I was like, who is this? And I thought maybe it's like John Byrne, George Perez, John Romita Sr., you know, just almost like a Marvel house style. Yep. Now, now, and Busema. Like, yep. I was like, is it one of those people? And I saw John Romita Jr., and I thought, wow, it's great. I just want to, like, I loved the art in this, and it was kind of cool to see what he used to look like. Yeah. I thought it was really fun, and, and also I was like, yeah, I think he used to be better at storytelling. <laughs> I think there were less constraints, but when you see the work that John Romita does now, he, comics are very different. Well, he was built for this era of comics yeah, that was all about that, action and adventure as opposed to talking heads. But even, like, I've seen him do, like... I remember one of my complaints when he was on Avengers is that whenever he would do a team shot, like it physically didn't make sense. It would be like all the characters were standing in the back were on risers that shouldn't have been there. Right. And here uh, he was doing giant crowd shots. And let's not the bit of the stadium with the 3000 characters. That is an amazing bit of work. Yeah, it's a great page. Double page. Uh, really like like that is a lot of work. And, and they really put it in there. 
I thought it was, you know, for all these characters and everything, it was pretty deftly handled. Yeah, and, the, and then when, you, when they broke up in smaller groups, I mean, everyone yeah. sort of got a little bit of business. Everyone got a little arc. <laughs> yep. And like I said before, you know, you get Iron Fist meeting Sue Storm for the first time or Captain America and Sasquatch meeting for the first time. And uh, you got really aggressively smoking Wolverine, which was funny. Like, he's much more of an was. asshole back at this point than he ends up being. You've got Black Panther, whose other power we didn't know about was to be able to change his race. Yeah, the the colorists were all over the place with who was under that mask. He was the he was like the uh, what's the the Watchman character? <laughs> uh, put it justice. He uh, at one point is very clearly Caucasian, especially <laughs> at a close up. I was like, what the fuck? And then the next page is is black because you can see his you can see the eye cutouts. They weren't all black too. He right. his eyes were visible, and at some points the skin around his eyes was was colored brown, and other times it's colored Caucasian, and. You've got a plant there, guys. You got to. You want to watch <laughs> yeah. out for that. You've got a roadie Tony Stark situation happening. <laughs> F- I'd fun. Look, it, it's very much of the time, and it's very much of the oh shit, we got to fix this on the fly kind of situation. And I and I found that respectable I, in, a, in a in a way. And I don't know that everyone will lo- love this book reading it from a modern perspective. But you know, I was reading comics at this time. I wasn't reading these comics at this at the time. But I, I have a place in my heart for this era of the end of the Bronze Age era of comics. I, I've find fascinating and we don't often talk yep. about the marvel books from that era usually people talk about bronze age to talk about dc i think that's funny that because i'm doing a lot of thinking about like why do why why am i able to enjoy this but if a comic did this today and some of the ones that we're talking about later are kind of like this right. you know we'd be like this isn't fun this is this is and i guess it's not modern and like you i give an excuse to comics from this era well you have to take everything within the context of when it was created yeah i guess so but they don't make comics like this anymore and if they did they would have no audience i think that that's fairly clear i don't know if the audiences are more sophisticated or they're looking for something different out of the stuff but like this wouldn't fly but like a really good example of that is that literally daredevil cannot stop daredevil doesn't say anything to anybody but in his head he's constantly reminding himself and us that he is blind and can't see anything. Like, if he was a person, he'd be like, I know you're blind, dude. I think that's great, and I think that should happen in modern comics, because that's mm-hmm. part of the problem when I read books now, is I don't know who the fuck anyone is or what they can do. Right. In the, in the intros, there's a really elegant one panel in which we meet Alpha Flight, in which we get everyone's name. And I think mm-hmm. that's the most important thing that, hap- that comics can do that they don't do now, is unless you're following every week for years, you don't know who you're, who, who you're talking about. And so here it's like... In the course of a conversation, they all are referring to each other by their name in some way or fashion. That's a rule. Like a long time ago, I was pretty good friends with, with Joe Casey, uh, and, and we would talk about, right, and he was reading some stuff, and he's like, you have to name the people. It was one of the first things he told me, and it always sticks with me, yeah. at least at the beginning of the issue, and then probably again. And I think that at some point, because he came up in a, like the era between the modern era and this era, basically, that would have been when, and, and so, but at some point, this naturalism in conversation sort of took over because everybody wants to really be a screenwriter. And so they're trying to make, right. they're trying to bend us. Right. And so like that doesn't feel as natural, but it's a thing that needs to happen. I think. Yeah. It's not at all natural. If I'm having a conversation with you, I don't say, Josh, look at this. Although sometimes I will say, Josh, look at this. Well, we're doing a program here. I'm not in a comic in which a reader needs to know who, who they're, right. you know, who they're dealing with, especially in a book like this, where you've got people who may not know who Alpha Flight is. So you need to have, be, you need to reference everyone's name. You just need to do that. And I, I, even modern comics, I'm reading like, who are you? You know, <laughs> just say the name. Connor, it's, it's Duke. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how many times I've got to tell you who Duke is, but that's Duke. What is Duke? I don't know. Why is Duke? Definitely don't know. I really enjoyed reading this, filling in my cultural knowledge of Marvel. <laughs> not that I don't have any, but like I've never, I had never read the story. So now I've read Contest of Champions and I understand what's going on. And I, I guess I didn't realize as a kid that, that those Avengers annual books were sequels to Contest of Champions. And now I know and now it makes sense. It was super fun. This is a quick bite, by the way. It's 76 pages total. It's about, I think, 72 pages of comic content. We're, when we pick books like this, we're going to make sure that's something that you can grab digitally if you need yeah. to. Well, we need to do it. And it was fun. Yeah, it's, it's 72 pages in a story, but the first 20 is is me, meeting everyone. Yep. <laughs> so it's not my, there's not a tissue in my story. And then at the end, there's this crazy glossary of every hero. Yep. One, two, three, four, five, six pages of every hero who is in the, in the Marvel Universe currently or dead. I did not read through all of that, but I did skim it. And I was like, wait, who was dead then? And I was like, not dead, not dead, not dead, <laughs> not dead. Inactive heroes, Miss mm-hmm. Marvel, Nova. Quasi heroes is my favorite. Blade, Agatha, Agatha Harkness. Punisher, Nick Fury. Dagger. Is Nick Fury quasi? Rick Jones? Come on. Rough, rough. Well, Rick he's Jones. a quasi hero in the fact that, like, 
he's just a dude, but then sometimes he's he gets some Doc powers. Savage. Who can forget Wood God? So, and then coming in May, Marvel's second limited series ever, The Prince of Power Hercules. So they, they talk about how Hawkeye's coming, it's Wolverine, Division, and Hawkeye are all getting miniseries. So that's what it's, it says here the, the, the glass theory. Welcome, one and all, to Mighty Marvel's first limited series. A special, all-new kind of comic book series designed to run a finite number of issues. That's nice. You know what I don't like? What? Is that these collections always have some cover by some contemporary yeah. artist. And this one's by Pepe Moreno. And it's not a bad cover, but it doesn't indicate what's inside. And I think that you're either going to fool people into thinking they're getting a different kind of comic, or you're not showing what's... In- like, I want to see... I want to see the original period art. It's just like recoloring the Neil Adams stuff. Oh, you mean in about. the back when they show one of the collections yeah. had a... Yeah, yeah. Drives I thought you were talking about this one, which has the original art, but recolored. No. Yeah, no, that's... that's no. There's and like which is the, all right, and then you, but then you turn the page and you get the original cover of, of number one, which is basically right. the, the same drawing, but colored appropriately. You're like, that's the stuff. There's that too, yes. It just but looks But the sort of flat. cover of the, of the collection... Oh, yeah, no, that was bad. ...in the store, it's, it's not... It's not it's not what it is. So just say what it is and be proud of it. I do feel like like the same thing. Like I couldn't find anywhere in here that said what year this was from. I had to look it up somewhere else. Mm. I used to always love when I got old comics. I'm sure you did this. I would look in the indicia, Mm -hmm. see when it was actually published. And that was also in the trade paperbacks of the same thing. And I can't find it anymore. It's like they hide it now. It's like, again, we were talking about the Batman book. They hit the prices. Right. And I just like I'm like just be, let it be what it is. They didn't hide the price in this one. Sixty cents an issue, which was a lot in 1982. It was. That's true. Yeah, that actually made me misjudge when it was. It's like sixty cents. That's mid. Well, you had every hero plus a lot of pages. Yeah, I mean, John Mita Jr. is probably still shaking his hand out from this one. <laughs> so, that's your pick of the week: Marvel Superhero yeah. Contest of Champions. Terrible title. No, it's all as a thing. It's great. <laughs> Which is similar to Marvel Superheroes Secret Wars. It's true. So that's your pick of the week. But DC put out a bunch of digital first books this week. Don't worry, none of them were even close to being attention to the pick of the week. <laughs> you know, too much fanfare and controversy. So what these books are is that DC had been putting out these DC uh, 80 or 100 page giants over the last couple of years, and what they would do to anchor them, which were, they were mostly reprints, was to put a short original piece in it. And those books were not available digitally. They were only in stores. So this is the first time the content's been available digitally, which is how Josh and I read. And so DC decided, since there's no content out there, to put these original pieces out as single issues. But because it's digital first, DC, what DC has done in the past is not put them out necessarily on Wednesday, which I think is stupid because that's when 90% of the audience is going to look for their comics. So on Wednesday, you had Superman, Man of Tomorrow, Batman, Gotham Knights, Wonder Woman, Agent of Peace. And then on Thursday, you had Aquaman, Deep Dives. Friday, as if we record this show, we had Flash, Fastest Man Alive. And then it's going to continue on next week, I think. Monday, I think, is uh, Mark Russell's Swamp Thing. Or maybe that's Sunday. I don't know. Either way, I think it's a dumb publishing strategy. But I'm not in charge. I don't see the metrics. I read Superman, Wonder Woman, Batman, Aquaman. I didn't get a chance to read Flash because I can't, like, literally were recording this the first thing in the morning. Um, these are not good. You told me that, and I, I read Wonder Woman, Superman, and Batman. Mm-hmm. I was a, a little more mixed than you, I think. Wonder Woman I was kind of bored with. I didn't like Wonder Woman. It reminded me of why I dropped Harley Quinn. It's just exhausting. Yeah, no, that I mean, that was kind of it. It was a Harley Quinn book, not a Wonder Woman book. It's true. And there were little bits of Amanda, Amanda Connor and Jimmy Palmiotti wrote it. And that, like, that's their thing. There were little bits of dialogue here and there. I was like, that's pretty good. But then at the end, like, it, I don't know. I, I, can't, I can't get with the new Harley Quinn. I don't think they're bad. I just found them all very middle of the road. So like there was bits of each book that I enjoyed. Yeah. But at the end of it, I was like, well, I mean, well, OK. And then I read Superman by Robert Venditti and Paul Pelletier. Mm-hmm. And I. This is the one that I thought this felt closest to the kind of comic that would have been out during Contest of Champions. Mm. Like it's just a thing that happened. There's a, a villain. Some Parasite, shit's going on. Yeah. And it was in a way it was not structured like a modern comic book at all. Yep. I found that really interesting because we don't do stories like this anymore. Superman's at work with Lois. They've got some shit going on. Oh, no, there's a problem at the power station. He's got to duck out and go take care of it. It was very much an old timey comic story but done certainly in a modern art style, 
But then also there were little bits of it where I like like one of those really charming bit where Lois talks about the fact that uh, ostensibly these are the modern incarnations of Lois and Clark. So they're they're married. He takes off and she's like, well, at least he didn't ruin his suit this time. And it's in little letters. So she's sort of whispering to herself. Replacing our clothes is wrecking our household budget. I loved that window. And then as he's flying away, he's like, I heard that because he's Superman. And I thought, oh, it's kind of cute. This issue I thought got better as I kept going. That was a good gag because then the payoff for that gag was that Perry shows up on the roof, so she has to toss his suit over the edge yeah. of the roof. So the she suit, sighs. Suit. She's like, "Ugh, yep." You know, and and it's a, it's a very straightforward sort of old school parasite story. But there's there's bits in it that I dug. I actually really I think Paul Pelletier really did a great job on Parasite mm-hmm. as he got more and more power. Like he kept getting bigger and more bulbous, and I was like, "That's just great monster drawing." And then he sort of shrinks down as he runs out of power. So I thought that was cool. And I did like there's a there's a bit of a, a morality issue like again like an old school comic like you know I can leave you here to starve or die or you know like I I'd find a way I'll find a way to help you like he does that and I think it's really interesting. Yeah, this was the best one of all of them. I, I mean, the, I think for me the problem was uh, there seems to be only one parasite story. Sure, because he's not terribly interesting, and there's no end to this. And so I was like, well, I think I've read this story, you know, twenty times and. I feel like I've only ever really seen that character in um, like the animated series. Like that's kind of mm-hmm. what I know him from. Which is totally great because you see him once in the yep. series and it's fine. Yep. And he's or he's like with somebody else and he's just one of those sort of big bruiser characters. I enjoyed that well enough, especially in you know the context of I had just read Contest of Champions and I was like, well, if I can judge this other book this one way, then I can judge this book the same way. And if that's what it is, then that's OK. And also, you know, in a desert, any drop of water. I did, not, <laughs> I did not feel that way about Wonder Woman. So then going over to Batman, this one was a little more interesting because there's two stories in it. One of them um, is an adapted story written by Brad Meltzer with art by Jim Lee. Yeah. Uh, Jim we've talked Lee about team. J- Scott Williams, Alex Sinclair. Yeah. Chris Eliopoulos, has he ever done a DC book before? I had that thought, but Brad Meltzer. No, I, I know why he did it because he and Meltzer worked together, but I don't think I've ever seen his name on a DC book before. I haven't either. I'm sure. He probably know, has, has, but... I'm sure, you know, Jim Lee, it's funny. I've talked about how I don't really like Jim Lee. And like the thing about it to me is it's just like, and I, I'm not, I'm not going to harp on this. It's just, I don't, I, it's just not interesting. It's not even bad. I'm just thinking it's just a guy, but maybe it's because everybody else copied him and that's what it looks like. Anyway, this was weird. I don't think it worked. I really didn't I don't think it worked. So the whole conceit is Batman has gone out. There's a crime. The cops are under fire and he's taking fire as he uh, goes to rescue the cops and two cops get shot. He goes to save them and in the course gets shot himself. And then the, these clown gang have Gordon captured. So he goes to save Gordon. Gordon's been shot. He's got to say, and the whole time I thought this is weird. Like, yep. I read a lot of Brad Meltzer comics. He really knows these characters. I thought this is, this is a weird story for Batman. Not the actual, what he's doing, but just the way it was written. And then it's revealed that, it's a Batmanified version of a real life soldier's Medal of Honor story. Mm-hmm. We, that's the reveal at the on the last pages. We see that the whole time we've been listening to President Obama speak about him from his Medal of Honor speech in 2010. And I would have just rather read his story rather than shoehorn in, into turning him into Batman. I mean, I, maybe maybe he's a big Batman fan. I don't, I'm not denigrating him at all, obviously, or no. the effort. It's a nice tribute, but like it just didn't work. It was weird. I think if they had front loaded it and let us know what the metaphor was, it would have worked better because it felt too odd. And then the the reveal, quote unquote, at the end made me like, oh, huh? And then I had to go back and read it again yeah, it so that weird. I understood it. I yeah, I don't I Brad Miltzer, you know, he's He's very good, and I, I know where his heart lay with these kinds of things. You know, like these kind of stories, I know why it would be important. And I think it was good attempt. I don't think it was ultimately very successful. It was just kind of strange. As and a I think storytelling right. piece, I don't think it worked. As a tribute, I think it's great. And I think, mm-hmm. you know, I, I see yes. why they did it. I'm sure, I mean, I don't know Sal Gunta, but maybe he's a big comic fan, Batman fan, which I'm sure he'd be thrilled by. But it just, for me as a reader, it was just like, what am I reading halfway through this? And then... Because it just it just didn't work, mm-hmm. and then the yeah, second poor story of this issue was by Larry Hama doing a Batwoman story, and Larry Hama famously one of our all time favorite writers, if only for his GI Joe work, but then did a really disastrous short run on Batman in the two thousands. Uh-huh. Marvel editor for a long time, yeah, really long legendary short. character in comics. Great, he has great stories himself, mm-hmm. just from working in comics. Uh, one of my favorite 
personalities in comics, I'll say. Mm-hmm. But I was just kind of bored with this. The only thing I enjoyed was his uh, the return of the Larry Hama explanatory captions for acronyms. I really liked this. I had I was I this like Mirko Kolek art who we recently saw in Red Sonia. Yeah. You know, as a, like a, just a war story of a thing going on. I, I don't know what it was in a Batman story. I know they made it Kate Kane or whatever. The only thing, again, I didn't like was there's a bit where she goes into the cave and then she sort of comes at the guy and she's, you know, there's a bat silhouette around her. Mm-hmm. And I thought that didn't work mm-hmm. because it was from out of nowhere. And also at that point is when they do the credits for the yeah. issue. Yeah. Which makes you feel like it's the end. Yes, I did. I thought that too. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I kept going because I always keep going. No, I did too. I go, I, I've, they've gotten me like this before. I bet there's one more page. And, you know, there was. And so I, I, I enjoyed it. I didn't really expect it. I really like the artwork. It's something about Mirko Kolak and female characters with bright red hair, <laughs> I guess, is a thing. I don't know. I had this thought that I don't feel like the people who are making comics read them anymore. <laughs> okay. Not always. Not across the board. That bit with where they put the credits, I've seen that in other things, is that they constantly are trying to find some place to do it. And I think this is related to what we were talking about earlier with naming the characters. They're looking at the credits being in there as like, a, like let's put it somewhere cool. You know, like how the director always puts his name on an awesome mm-hmm. shot, mm-hmm. you know, the beginning or so, or at least it's thoughtful. And I think they're trying to do this, but it's like the comic book has a flow and things need to happen where they know so you know what's going on. And putting your credits in on page 11 of a 20-page book or, you know, page – five of a of a seven page book like it's just it's it's bad practice i don't like it i don't i think it throws me off it i've i've not finished comics with it's comics definitely books. one of your bugaboos it is oh oh if i could go backwards just a little bit uh-huh there are a great many instances in contest of champions of left hand panel stacking and for the most part it's done with arrows and if it isn't done with arrows, the lettering was really good to lead you where you need to. I did not get lost in that. This is going to be discussed later in the show. Okay. And then just to round it out, I, Aquaman was just basically one giant fight scene, and I didn't read Flash. So, I mean, look, I'm glad that some new content came out for people. I don't think any of these comics were bad. I thought, for the most part, the average was very middle of the road. Yes. I think the average, but- if you averaged out the storytelling and... The level of enjoyment, I give this entire week a C. There were things I liked. There were things I thought were really boring. For the most part, it averages out to a C for me. Or a two and a half stars for the week. I would give it a B, but let's, let's keep in mind that when I was a kid, I got all Bs one year and I got my skateboard taken away for a month. Okay. Because a B means I wasn't trying very hard. Okay, so... <laughs> Sorry, that's... that's <laughs> that explains much. Yes, it so, does. So, you know, DC put these books out. They talked about putting more stuff out in the following weeks. A lot of controversy. Not really going to get into it during this part of the show, but uh, we'll see what happens uh, next let week. Let me guess. Retailers don't like that. There you go. There it is. Explain. <laughs> Nailed it in one. Not going to take a side on that. Not going to talk about it. You make your own conclusions. Let's move along. So we'll see what happens next week. Who knows? This is We're, we're making this up as it goes along. We're going to jump to the patron powers now. Uh, Patreon.com slash iFanboy is a thriving community. And if you're uh, there, normally you can have, uh, you can vote out a book at the rundown. We thought about doing these DC books, but they since they came out one a day, we didn't know what, which ones would be out by the time we were doing the show. Time to read, so we just we couldn't do it. Uh, but so as soon as there's books to come out, the patron vote will be back. But in the meantime, we'd like to thank our patrons who give it the five dollar higher level with patron powers. So why don't you start us off, Josh? Sure, Brian McKinney comes in, and what Brian has is he. He uh, has speakers in his mouth and teeth, and when he receives an incoming signal of any kind, which he can do wirelessly, either by Bluetooth or radio frequency, he has an amazing surround sound that will fill any room with beautiful, uh, rich sound. a human sound. surround sound speaker? Yeah. Yeah, but he also can input the signals. That's important. Is he Bluetooth enabled? Can I send my phone to his... Yes. Him? Yeah, and if he gets with that other guy earlier who has the... <laughs> Perfect Bluetooth reception. Uh, you really got something. You know what's really frustrating for me is like my sound bar died uh, right before the quarantine. Bad time. And so I got a new one. It's you know much newer. The old one I had ahead for I had forever. So like this is the first time I could Bluetooth to something uh, to the, to that sound bar. So I could Bluetooth my phone, mm-hmm. which has some music on it, but not a ton of music. I can't Bluetooth my computer, which has all the music on it. Interesting. Like I, it's I. I have Bluetooth capability on the computer. Obviously, uh, the speakers Bluetooth. They're about ten feet apart in the room, but they won't recognize each other, and it's frustrating. I really wanted to just try to troubleshoot this on the show, but I'm not going to. 
Um, it's not going to get us anywhere, but like I'm, I'm instantly in customer support mode. I'm like, all right, all right, all right. Let's just, it's just annoying. Should we do a tech support segment? No. <laughs> every episode? No, I think it's a bad call. So anyway, that would be great because then I could finally yeah. play my computer music. What about a hard connection? Can you do a hard connection? Uh, not, not the way I have things set up. Okay. Kenneth Go- Gobert. Do you think that's or, cool? uh, or which Goobert. was the word that Spider Man used in uh, Into the Spider Verse? Uh, Goober. Goobert. Goubert. Uh, I'm just going to assume you're French. Kenneth, he gains the collective knowledge of everyone in his immediate family. So siblings and parents, anything they they learn and know, he then knows. And this would include people who marry into his family. There's a legal component. Right. So like if someone marries a sibling of his, I don't know if he has siblings, but assuming he does, then he gains the, the knowledge of that of that. Brother-in-law, sister-in-law, whoever. He gains yes. the, the, the knowledge and the skills mm-hmm. of everyone in his immediate family. So if someone in his fa- if his if his sister, maybe he doesn't have a sister, but if his sister goes to law school, mm-hmm. he's, it's like he went to law school. Okay. Or if his does brother he, is, becomes a doctor, he suddenly has the skills and knowledge of a doctor. Does he contribute anything to them? No, he's, he's a receptor. So he's he doesn't a, he's a parasite. He's a, he's a skills and knowledge parasite, yes. Now, I'm going to get a little philosophical. Mm-hmm. You, you, knowledge is often colored by your perceptions and your mm-hmm. opinions. Does he absorb any of that, or is he able to take it in objectively and ap- apply his own worldview to it? The opinion-based aspect of it sort of filters out. Okay. You know, he knows the facts. Mm-hmm. And as we know, as much as people want to try otherwise, facts are facts. And so he knows, say, how to fix a carburetor if his dad's really good at that kind of thing like he knows uh-huh. these things uh-huh. he doesn't have to learn it he just knows it well you know in this fictional scenario you've set up his his family is a real bunch of young professionals right well i don't know i'm just i you know that's a best case scenario i hope that you know like they're not they're not they're not doing anything maybe someone he his family works in it and he can fix my bluetooth problem i'll tell you something you know what his his role in the family is? His role in the family is encourage all those people to better themselves. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you go to law school? You know what you should do? You're very good at this. The <laughs> other side of it would be that like he would know like, yeah, my brother is a terrible doctor. He's making it all up. <laughs> because the fact is he just did something and I don't know what it is. He's wrong. <laughs> right. All right. Patreon.com slash Ivanway. If you give it the $5 or higher level, you get your own superpower live on the show. As, long, as well as other perks, which we'll get into later. And thanks, everyone who does. Let's talk about patreon.com slash iFanboy. At the beginning of the show, we say very specifically that the show is brought to you by listeners like you. And uh, we uh, have made a great deal of progress over the over this uh, pandemic time. People have, uh, I, I, I guess, have appreciated the show that we do a little more often. And uh, and they've, they've come out to support. And, and, man, that is wonderful and beautiful. And thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate it. But... You've given us some more work because yeah. we hit the stretch goal. So now we are adding, you know, as long as we're up there, we're adding our, our monthly non-comics media podcast, which which is in process. We are planning. We are watching. We are preparing. <laughs> we are we are doing the things so that we have something to talk about, which, by the way, uh, if you have to watch your wife's favorite movie with her <laughs> while you're trying to come up with material for a show and you're hyper analyzing literally everything on screen, she might leave the room. You don't have to verbalize it. You can do it in your head or on a pet notepad. I got to bounce it off her. She's smart. She's funny. She has a very good, this particular area of expertise, she's useful. See, if Kenneth Goubert was your brother, he would know how to make wrong decisions. Yeah, that's true. So we're working on the all media show, which should be soon. What month yeah. is it? Uh, yeah, be, this uh, month. It's this month? It's this okay, month. Okay, before so the end of the month. It's gonna, I mean, this month ends this week, so we're going to get it out for you this week. Okay. And then, of course, we have already begun uploading. And when I say we, I, I mean not me. Um, <laughs> I don't want to take credit for it. Uh, missing full-length video shows and minis have already started up. I have watched the first mini, and I was – like on one hand, I was like, this is terrible. On the other hand, I was like, good job, Josh. That was also, pretty good. Also, who is that guy? Oh, I mean, it's, it's, he's a ghost. <laughs> so they're going up on YouTube. They're going to be re-embedded on the website. We, I mean, it isn't going to be a thing where you're going to get up one day and there's going to be 500 shows up there. No, it's, it's not going to work that it's way. It's a bit of a process, uh, and also uh, we have other things going on. So it's going to be a, you're going to get a handful of new ones a week. Yeah, we're we're doing our best to do that regularly. If we can 
speed it up and we will with that. That's how it's got to be right now. Get over to the t-shirt store at ifanboy.threadless.com. There are eight designs. I spoke at one point about being able to get some of the stuff on a mask, but I guess we're not able to do that. So t-shirts, sweatshirts, mugs, fridge magnets, these kind of things. The uh, stay home and read comics uh, shirt has been really popular uh, and, and we're glad about that. And we are collecting those payments and half of those are going to go to comic stores in need. We're still trying to figure out exactly the way to do that. Yeah, we think possibly the comic book United Fund, which was created this week by DC and Lions Forge, that seems like a good place to go. So we're yeah, that's but, probably but, what we're I mean, doing, but we're not. That is doing. our promise. Uh, like, we oh, are it's going to go somewhere. We just yes, we've been waiting for something like this to happen before we said where, and this is, seems like yep. a good place, but we haven't fully investigated it yet. That's actually you guys yep. making a donation to that and helping comic books stay afloat. So do that, please. Uh, you know, either it's through us or other ways. And then you can also, if you don't want to deal with any of that, you can just sort of go to, uh, I guess, our tip jar over at ifanbo.com slash support. You can find a link just to PayPal. Big thanks to Adam H., who uh, had been thinking about leaving a tip for 15 years, he let us know. And he did. He, he threw something in the pot, and we really appreciate that. <laughs> and, and we appreciate that he'd been thinking about it for so long. You know, it's never too late. For the length of the show, which is great. You can go to ifanboy.com slash Amazon, and you can find links to buy the books on the books Blowed. You'll always find a link to the, the pick of the week, especially it's in digital form now a lot of the time, uh, and a general link to buy Amazon stuff if that's the thing that you want to do. I and mean, we thank everybody who does those things. And I mean, I keep saying thank you, and I keep saying we appreciate it because I feel like I'm, I cannot properly communicate what that means to us. Um, but rest assured, I absolutely mean that. Um, and so does Connor. And, and thank you so much, everyone. For helping anybody you can help your help your stores you know help whoever you can because right now this is a take care of everybody time for sure let's welcome ron to the show now hey guys good to be back and yes help your comic book stores Yo, always we're gonna talk about gi joe gi joe corner this is episode Ugh. four duel in the devil's cauldron the mass device part four originally aired september 15th 1983 as always directed by dan thompson written by ron friedman produced by Ron friedman marvel productions and this is our our Check-in, our weekly check-in of the oh. daily episode of G.I. Joe. We're at part four or five, so we're reaching the climax of the story here. As the episode begins, Cover Girl and Timber team up to save G.I. Joe from the booby trap that Cobra left in Snake Eyes' radioactive container. I assume that's why Cover Girl's hair changed. Maybe it all fell out and she had to wear a short brown wig after that. Well, I got to say, before we get into it, this has become the highlight of my week, by the way. <laughs> I can hear it in your voice. But yeah, no. And like, like literally the other night at dinner, my wife was just like, uh, oh, you've got to watch G.I. Joe. I was like, oh, you're right. <laughs> right. And uh, and I just so, so, so excited. And I do got to say, I have, so I have a list of things for this week's episode. But I do got to say, for the first time in four episodes, not my favorite episode. It is a much less convoluted episode than episode three. Yes. And I do find it funny that essentially, if you remember earlier in this story arc, Duke was captured by Cobra. Yeah. And they just seem to be redoing that plot line with Scarlet. I mean, <laughs> we're going to be, depending on how long we do these for, I mean, buckle up. <laughs> Don't, this, the basic plot is we need to go get these three things. And we're, you know. You know how Neil Gaiman always <laughs> does a story about gods hiding in plain sight? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's called a trope. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and so, and I just, I keep, I don't have the audio on, but I keep flicking back to bits of the show. And I was like, this whole episode is pretty much get that and meet the ball out of the spicy sauce. <laughs> That's what this whole thing is. Using much more, I will, you will, I know you have a list, uh, uh, using more very unsound science. That's my favorite I, that, That's my, the theme of this episode is, listen, I'm not an expert in aerodynamics <laughs> or physics yeah. or anything like that, yeah. but I'm pretty sure some of the shit we see in this episode is impossible, starting with cover girl with her blonde flowing locks, who, by the way, knew Timber's name. Right. She never saw Snake Eyes write it down. <laughs> and why Timber needs to be involved in this who knows? Because in series three, there was an action figure. <laughs> but Actually, the, it didn't move. <laughs> the act of putting the canister not in the tank that CoverGirl was driving previously, but some you know, a, like a Jeep-like Jeep. thing to get it out of there totally makes sense. Up until she drives outside and does this donut spin move to hurl the canister <laughs> out of the place. like that, that seemed to be a bit of a gambit. Like, do they have a little catapult in the back that they just activated to shoot it off? And then, no, I think she was literally using just perpetual force. And then there. where did it go? It just sort of, just, ah, fuck it. It's out there. <laughs> 
It's over. It's over the fence. We're fine. <laughs> it's in Springfield. Let them deal with it. Yeah, it, it landed in the in the river that flows through the town. It's, it'll be fine. <laughs> Somewhere I mean, that... the guy from uh, Chernobyl is like, no. No. <laughs> no. Now, I will say that so after they all – then they all wake up and they're fine from the, the effects sure, of the gas. Sure. Yeah, when they woke up 15 years later and all riddled with cancer. <laughs> <laughs> I will give them credit that they get the video transmission from Stalker who has informed them that G.I. Joe is surrendering to Cobra. And I bought that hook, line, and sinker. Well, first of all, it, it came in a scrambled video, which was that old game where you moved the pieces yeah. around until you got the picture. Well, it was like that's how you that's how Gio scrambles their video. Is not it's not really the Enigma system, is it? It's just that the image is out of order, not that the scr- signal is scrambled. But yeah, and then also they had all the miniatures of their whole army ready to go, which led <laughs> led to well, the so, best. Well, let, so, if those that haven't watched it, what they did was they knew Cobra was tapping into their secret, secure puzzle video system, <laughs> and so what they did was they set up a mock transmission from Stalker, telling him that they were surrendering, utilizing miniatures of the entire armory behind him and an elaborate set and lighting. So they didn't identify the Joe that worked on this, but I got to assume there's a G.I. Joe who specializes in special effects and grip work. Right. Yeah, they, his, his code name is Testers or Hollywood. What they don't yeah. know is that every time they build a Jeep or hire a new Joe, they immediately have someone making a miniature. And it's just in case. It's in the back. It's actually Definitely. a really meta way of talking about the toys. <laughs> But, not, Whoa. but, not, but none, of the, none of the miniatures they showed were the actual toys we could get. Well, they had the tanks. Well, no, but not the tank with those missiles and all. That didn't come out for years until years later. The Mobat? Yeah, anyway. Not it the Mobat. the early tank. The one that CoverGirl dr- uh, drove yeah, with the missiles. The, with, yeah. The green is in that shot. Yeah. Anyway. That's in that shot. Then there's a it's, – it's interesting because actually the vehicles were – a lot of them were hinting at, at the toy, but weren't quite there. Like, those are the dragonflies, but they never said, like, this is the dragonfly, and it'd be a little bit different. And I remember as a kid, like, I always wanted them to name the toy that I had. <laughs> if, I, if I got the thing, I wanted to see it in the show. Yep. For sure. By the way... Are you talking about the dinner scene, Josh? Uh, which none? You said this led to the best scene. Oh, no, the best scene is Gung Ho uh, coming into the, the, the shot, like the old David Patterson SNL sketch. <laughs> he's like, I just have, I just have to play with the toys. That I guess that scene was offensive, and they got rid of it. But it's one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. I called it a gung ho episode. In my notes, because yeah. yeah. yes, yeah, he was sort of the main guy they focused on. The only two new Joes that I saw was one was Ace, and then there yep. was another pilot who I couldn't remember whose name it was. There was two pilots. Oh, the, the Sky Striker pilot with the with the mask. Right? That's Ace. That's Ace, and then there was another pilot he was talking Crazy to. Leg. Was it Crazy Legs? I think he just jumped out of planes. I didn't think he flew planes. He might be a paratrooper guy. I, well, I think he's got to be in the plane at some point. That's true. What's interesting, at some point, like, they're flying the dragonflies, which interior just changes a lot with those things. In the toy, it was just two seats, you know, oh, one yeah. after the other. In this one, it's as wide as they needed to be. It's like, it's like a hoot. They, they're standing up so they could jump yeah. out of it at that point. And, yeah. And uh, and I was annoyed because Gung Ho was flying it, and Wild Bill was standing up behind him. I was like, "No, <laughs> no, Wild Bill flies the helicopters. <laughs> oh, oh. He's like the Quint of uh, of GI Joe." <laughs> Wild Bill's magic hat, which stays on even when he's yeah. flying through the air in a jetpack upside down, no matter what. His cowboy hat is going I, nowhere. I had yeah. that note as well. I don't understand the the rules with the jetpacks because Stalker's wearing his in the video. He's just walking around with a jetpack on. But then the other Joes, when they attack Cobra with the jetpack, and this happened in previous episodes, they land and they immediately take them off. Even if they are attacking, in this case, a flying Cobra ship in which they have no way to get off of without the jetpack. That's a, that's a helicarrier. Just. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's like literally like I was like, oh, so it's just a helicarrier. That's it. But, yeah. but, we're, but we're, we're, we're somewhat getting ahead of ourselves because we're, we're skipping the, the moment where – they, they, you know, so to get the last element, they need to lift a meteor out of a volcano using several <laughs> of of the helicopters and and magnets and all that sort of stuff. Which I'll give them, right? Like that lifting, that sort of thing is fine. Sure. Um, then Cobra with the helicarrier comes in and extends a large net <laughs> and and instigates a an ex, uh, the volcano to explode. This is a bad plan. To, to shoot the meteor up. And land in the net, and and I'm like, that's not gonna work. The, and then, the, the, and and then, only to be trumped by the geniuses <laughs> behind GI Joe to have Duke and who was flying the other Sky Striker? Was it, it Ace? I think. Was it Ace? Yeah. 
swoop in with a net connecting the two Sky Strikers <laughs> to catch the meteor before Cobra does. And that's when I went, this might not be real. But wait, <laughs> but wait. The effect of that, all yes. of it ridiculous, was the most realistic thing that happened is, is that, that, that flaming hot meatball went right through that net. <laughs> right, but it landed That's in Cobra's correct. net, which, yeah, they that have, was Listen, well, so Cobra, had, at they, get better point, nets. they get better nets. Seconds yes. before, while the meteor is launched, Duke says it's a, it's a high fly ball to center field. How did he connect to Ace's Sky Striker <laughs> with the net? Magic. Oh, I love this but show so much. Destro's plan was not scientifically sound we're just going to shoot the side of this volcano until we cause an eruption right it's like, very dangerous I, I, got a gut. I got a gut instinct this will work <laughs> i was like or at least it's something at least they're kind of explaining it even though it's wrong but i i keep going back to the idea that like cobra's really got something here like they are <laughs> josh, amazing. josh likes their ideology he's all no, for cobra saying, they're amazing technologists clearly they have some sort of they're either amazing with making their resources stretch because their infrastructure is – they're not even a nation, and they built a helicarrier. They've got all these – like, I feel like they're going about it wrong. You know in Austin Powers when Robert Wagner's like, we, we are making much more money than that with our legitimate businesses. I'm like, Cobra, you just just sell your shit. Yeah. You That's why that joke worked. Be. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. All these places oh, could just patent their fucking weapons. But to me, my favorite bit was while watching Stalker's fake surrender video – Cobra oh, Commander yes. and Destro are having a grand feast, and Cobra Commander is sitting there waving around a half-eaten drumstick, but he's got his full face mask on. <laughs> yeah, that's how that works. How did he know. take a bite out of it? <laughs> and then he just slams the table a bunch of times and causes all the food to bounce and then bounce off the table. And I thought, man, all that chicken. Yeah, all that chicken. One thing Connor hates is wasted chicken. <laughs> so yeah, that that whole uh, the 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 cover commander uh, versus the dining room table was just nuts. The one thing I, I didn't like about the show, just legitimate non jokey thing, is yeah, I loved the hooded Cobra Commander look. That was my favorite Cobra Commander look, yeah. and they never used that on the cartoon. The thing is, I liked I I I I worried. I thought about this a lot as a kid, and, and he could have eaten under I, there. Because I got the hooded figure in the giveaway. Like you could mail in to get the and, and with with proofs of purchase and, and money you could get the hooded figure and it was a it was a molded plastic hood yep. and that was like the gem of my collection. I really hope I still have that at my parents' house. It was like but, a um, rubber, right? Yeah, it was rubbery, yeah, yeah. But I love the the conceit that at home he wears the hood. But yep. in the field, he wears the the mirror sh mask, right. the mirror shell. That, that that's how I rationalized it in my play. I remember being really excited. I know it's, I thought the same thing, and I didn't want it to only have the hood, but I wanted to sometimes have the hood, and yeah. I feel like it didn't have. Yeah. Yep. And then I also did like it later when they gave him the suit of armor. I thought, thought that figure was awesome because I was like, okay, now he can finally do something. Right. Now, this character of the. Cobra Commander, less likely with it, but I always thought that was fun. I do want to go back to Stalker. The thing that you might guys may not know about him is that all the other Joes thinks he's nuts. He won't take that jetpack off anywhere. He wears it to the mess hall. <laughs> hey, if, if you got a jetpack, if you if you got a jetpack, I would wear it too. I don't blame him. I mean, him. he's he's trained on it a lot, so you know he can get away with a lot more than everybody else. But man, like you don't separate that guy. There are many jetpacks like this, but this one is mine. Uh, that's his thing. He's the jetpack guy. That's his whole identity. So I get that. He holds on to it because when he was in Vietnam, he was constantly having his jetpack stolen. Because as, well, as we like, know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, because they would sell those for drugs in Vietnam. Also, as you can tell, I watched this late last night. My notes for the net sequence says the psychics of the nets as opposed to the physics because that's how tired I was when I watched it. Oh, yeah. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so one other note to make on the on on the helicarrier scene. So they swore so the Joes swarm the helicarrier. They storm it with the jetpacks yep. mm -hmm. and it becomes just a flat out battle on this helicarrier, right? Yep. Like no one taking aim on either side. Just just rampant shooting. I did notice the sound effect of not only the blasters, but they did layer in a machine gun sound effect. They've been doing that. that. Yes. Yeah, that was yeah. Have you noticed that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the that Joes have the machine gun sound, yeah. and the other ones get the laser one. And so, so, and then they 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 capture. They, somehow they capture the entire crew of Cobra on this helicarrier and put them in a glowing fence cell. That never explained how that works. Yeah. And except they didn't get Destro, so Scarlet arms her dinky handheld crossbow with one arrow, 
while everyone's shooting these amazing, she's got this little one arrow crossbow and she goes after Destro. Um, that ineffective weapon. I had noted that as well. Yes. Very ineffective weapon. Right? <laughs> Although, but when she shoots it, it's also a laser bolt that shoots the arrow. <laughs> like it just made no sense. But then also, and, like, and also morphed into this like weird, like, yeah. Goo. They, they, call, had, they called it something. It was like a combustion arrow or something. Yeah. It was, yeah. That looked like Thermal. a glue arrow though. As a, as a green arrow and a uh, Hawkeye Thermal. fan, I was like, that's a, that's a glue arrow. Yeah, and, and they called also, it a thermal arrow. Yeah, yeah. So, and it has a massive uh, explosive uh, capability also. Like, it made a huge explosion after it sort of landed on the ground next to the stuff. Yeah. So they also, Cobra tries, even though they have a, because Cobra Commander's an idiot, he tries to steal or destroy New York with his limited amount of resources. And somehow the beam which they shoot gets stopped in the air. Even I feel like the... Once you shoot the beam, even if you destroy the machine, the beam is still out there. Yep. So the beam shouldn't just disintegrate. It should still hit the building. It's like a circuit. Like it needs to hit the next thing. And if it doesn't have the... It can't close the circuit, it disperses. Maybe. Or it would go to the ground. I don't know. I was looking at it coming. Kind of like, There's no matter what you do now. That's going to hit that building. Right. But maybe it didn't have a spot to... I'm trying it's to like if you it. fire a missile and you destroy the missile launcher. The missile's still out there. The missile doesn't just then disintegrate in the sky. Well, I mean, let's talk about the fact that when they explained that the third element is this bit from a, a meteor that landed, that is floating in the, in the middle of, of a nice and spicy sauce. Yeah. How did the doctor know to use that and get it? And how did he get some before that the thing is still there? Like, none of that made sense. None like, of it. What were you trying to do? You also, can't the meteor the landed in the volcano with no splash or anything. Mm-hmm. It, it came from space. It, it landed came from space. in the volcano, and that, that was it. <laughs> that it would have that that lava would have wiped out yeah. a large area of Earth. Like that could have been an extinction event if that thing did that. I'm excited for the finale. I'm excited to see. Also, we should know talking about jetpacks. Uh, Snake Eyes' jetpack was purple because he's always coordinated. Co- co- oh, uh, by the way, I, I forgot the moment where Snake Eyes, um, where he's on the jetpack and turns oh, to, yeah. catch t- to catch Timber and then carry him to the helicarrier swarm because Timber is a part of the team too, but he can't fly a jetpack. And for a moment, I'm like, why didn't they give the dog a jetpack? I would have, that would have, would have been a nice addition. Better. That would have been better. I, yeah. I didn't like Timber's, uh, uh, just, uh, his spontaneous jump. I was his like, that's yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No. You know what? You just you don't have to go everywhere. Timber. And also, and also, I get Timber is ferocious and a great thing, but like that Cobra soldier was just like uh, he apparently doesn't like dogs. He just froze up immediately. Yeah. That he's he tackled. Yeah. Well, he's, like a, wolf. he's like a he's like a hundred wolf. hundred pound wolf. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but so then ultimately, Scarlet and Destro have a little tete a tete that ends with Destro getting the upper hand and laughing at GI Joe and taking her hostage, much like the same thing that happened to Duke earlier in this week. Yes. Of, of wanna, five episodes. <laughs> I want to point out something. All through this week, the thing has been like this this sort of push-pull between pretty good art and animation and really bad art and animation. Mm-hmm. Like, like, it's very odd. Uh, like, some sections, I know they outsourced a lot of this, I think, to Korea, I think it was done at the time. It, like, some of it, you're like, well, that's pretty good. And then other times, like, this is just terrible. I have sent you both an image mm-hmm. uh, in the Slack channel of the Cobra Wedgie issue. Right. Um, All right. There's a shot about 11. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 1145. <laughs> yep. Uh, where Baroness walks away, underwear way up her butt. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Cobra Commander turns around even worse. Yeah, no. The, and the, it's the, so. The, the, the Cobra uniform is very well, tight. They have, a, they have a Cobra issued thong they all have to wear. Here's the it's, thing also Cobra is really into pleats. <laughs> like there are, lots of, there are lots of pleating going on in that outfit, in those outfits, um, along with being tight. Yeah. So. Yeah. That was a very, like, we're not going to outline the fact that these people have butts. Yeah. We're going to draw their butts. Listen, you got to sell toys to kids, so butts is the way to go. This is one of the first times that I, I, I saw there was like a full shot of Scarlet, and I was like, that's a stupid uniform. <laughs> it's, it's a Jane Fonda workout uniform. Like, yeah, why? but armored. I know. It's just... just her bust area is armored, then the yes. rest. And Gunko's vest is a little short. <laughs> it's a little blue, blue oyster. I never really liked Gung Ho, and I think it's because of the cartoon. He's kind of a buffoon. Who's a, who, and he was one of them. He became one of their main focus characters, which I think annoyed yeah. me. Because in the comics, he was never one of my favorites. So the fact that he was always one of the main guys in the show kind of 
annoyed me. So as a result, I did. I was I, I wasn't as annoyed at him being a main guy in the show because I get the look. I mean, the, I mean, the no shirt tattoo look. Come on. Mm-hmm. It's, not, it's 1983 here. Like, great. Right. But I will say that that I was more annoyed by the constant use of G.H. Right. Like, you're OK. We're going to abbreviate his name. Right. Also, this episode had, you know, like I do love the G.I. Joe and Cobra as punctuation. This episode really, really overdid it. A lot of Yojos. A, a lot of Yojos and a lot of Destro go Cobra. Like, just, <laughs> he's not even a member of Cobra. I know. He's a he's contractor. A contractor. <laughs> <laughs> he had a lot of evil laughs. In his- <laughs> like, he was just tickled pink through the last act. Yeah. Totally right, so next week we get the exciting conclusion to the mass device uh, with part five, which I don't have the name in front of me. The preview promises for it to be action packed. And there's a very cool guy who's in who's in the jail that they there's like they show this real quick shot of all the slaves being liberated. And there's like one guy with sunglasses. Yep. A stake in the serpent's heart is the next chapter. Oh, uh, they have good titles. They have great titles. This is 82 Marvel, so we're talking about, you know. Gung Ho was later replaced with Bazooka, who became the, the big buffoon of the team. Yeah. If you remember that. And I, I was okay I, with it when he did it, because he had like a, he wasn't wearing the odd clothing. I'm just looking forward to Roadblock and his rhyming couplets. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm looking forward to the first time that we see Alpine, and he does his yodel, and then ends, oh yeah, at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just waiting. Like, don't get us spoilers, man. Don't get ahead of I'm it. not. Oh. I just, I'm so excited. I mean, Ooh, yeah. We haven't even gotten into the, it, it, we haven't even seen Shipwreck yet. That's true. Ah, yeah. You know what? I Save it. Just, Save I, it. I know. I know. We have to. No, this this episode. I have to finish it. There were a, a lot of sort of like weird gags that were out of nowhere. Like um, I'm I don't remember who exactly the characters were, but Breaker or whoever they are. Yeah. And Breaker somebody and started to tell him something. Goes, why are you asking me that? If I say there it is, I mean it's the. Oh yeah, it's yeah. Like that, a minute. <laughs> There's a lot of vaudeville in this one. Yeah, and it was like, and they're always like deep Brooklyn guys. It's Breaker yeah. and Short Fuse, one of whom was supposed to be from yeah. Chicago, but of course we know that the voices don't match up with the character bios. Yeah. It was like listening to uh, characters from like Band of Brothers. Well, they yeah. clearly, I mean, these guys, you know, it's the 80s, probably a lot of them are the age where they watch a lot of war movies, and the war movies in the 40s always, the 50s always had the Brooklyn characters, yeah. the Wiseacre Brooklyn characters, so, you know. Yep. That's, it was great. I enjoyed it. So that was... Duel in the Devil's Cauldron, the Mass Device Part 4, G.I. Joe, Real American Hero. And as I said before, next week we'll be back for Part 5 and the conclusion to the Mass Device. Love it. Oh, I can't wait. This is, this is seriously the highlight of my week. Uh, thank you, guys. Um, well, I would love to stay, but I have to go uh, make lunch for my children. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bid you guys adieu with this single greeting, Yo, Joe. Yo, Joe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Enjoy All the show. Right. Ron's going to go. We're going to do some email. John V. Uh, of, of Brooklyn <laughs> writes in and says, I'm not doing that. Connor's trolling defense of left-hand panel stacking is technically true. Yes, you know what to do, but that's exactly the problem. The physical process of reading a comic should be automatic, unconscious act. Left-hand panel stacking makes you engage your conscious thought, which breaks the flow. Neurologically, we're talking about the activation of the cerebellum versus the activation of the cerebral motor cortex. Automatic, unconscious actions like tying your shoes and buttoning your shirt are controlled by the cerebellum. Movement that you have to think about and pay attention to, like untying a hard knot in your laces or needs to recruit the planning centers of the motor cortex. When we learn a movement, it happens in our motor cortex. When we've repeated enough times to memorize it, it moves to our cerebellum. Like when you learned to tie your shoes and needed to think about it, now you don't. I move in the same way. In left-right reading cultures, we learn to move our eyes left to right across the page. And then at the end of the line, jump back down uh, and to the left to start a new line. Doing this millions of times in our life carves a deep groove in our cerebellum, deviating from that eye movement pattern, as in the le- case of left-hand panel stacking, requires more activation of the motor cortex, therefore more conscious thought, therefore messing with the flow of the art. Like driving around a curb versus making a sharp right turn. In both situations, you know what to do, but the former flows better than the latter. I've been thinking about this since Connor's first complaint about Josh's complaint, which is probably closer to a decade ago than I want to consciously think about. John V was one of our longtime emailers. And people on the site, and he always wrote really terrific stuff, if you recall. He wrote really great uh, user reviews back in the day. Oh, yeah, 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 for sure. I'm old and therefore don't totally understand trolling. But what I seem to understand is it's jokingly done. Whereas I was not trolling Josh. I was being serious. (laughs) And I don't even bother trying to change Connor's mind about anything. My response to John would be... 
then I guess my cerebellum has carved the groove for it because I never have the problem. I never have to think about left handed panel stacking. I just read it the proper way. I've been reading comics for 30 odd years. So I guess it's just cut that groove into the cerebellum. <laughs> You're a Republican of sto- comic storytelling. <laughs> just, I've just learned how not to do it. Not a problem for me. It's not a problem for me. That's the, that's my whole point the entire time. And also, clearly not a problem for these professional comic people who keep doing it. I've talked to pros. They know. Then they wouldn't do it, though. I didn't talk to the ones who did it. Actually, I saw one in a book that a guy I know did do. And I was like, should I? No, I'm not going to. I'm not going to check with them. Like, why'd you do this? It doesn't matter. It doesn't. It's fine. I Although, this email was fantastic. And I actually really enjoyed reading it. Yes. I don't know what that says about me, but it was, it was. I was like, "Oh, this is intelligent. I have to think about it." Now, on the other words. hand, I remember when we did, you know, when we were reading manga the last couple of years. I remember really, you know, breaking my brain trying to do that. Yeah. So I understand the pain in my brain reading manga backwards was not. I don't experience any pain reading left-handed panel stacking, which Josh might, and that just means our brains are grooved differently. I remember getting into the groove with those really. No, by like, the end of it, your brain has learned how to do it, but in the beginning, you're just like, ah. Have you ever driven in like on a left hand side oh, drive yeah, country? Yeah. I That's drove in crazy. Ireland. I was going to die. Well, it's funny because you adjust and you get used to it, but then at some point something happens requiring you to, you, you, like, you, you just don't normally think about. Like, I think there's about twice where I was nearly almost killed because I was like, look to the left, nothing coming, you know, because I don't have to look to the right or whichever, yeah. you know. And, like, all of a sudden, I almost pulled into traffic in a car that's about to kill me. That happened, I think, twice, and I, I'm still, like, clenched. And then the reverse happened when I came back. Yes. And I didn't have to drive on the right side. I was like, what is going on? That's why there's all those signs on the on the road in, in London that are like, look, <laughs> look, you Taurus moron. <laughs> Let's do Shane C. He says, I just found I fanboy within the past year and have really enjoyed your weekly analysis a lot. Also, I just read all 54 issues of Saga – and really wanted your take on the story so far. However, when I went back to the week of issue 52 coming out, you didn't mention it. So now this Four. is your chance. What are your impressions of the story so far? Please include as many spoilers as you want. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that permission, Shane. I stopped reading it. I assume you did too. I didn't stop reading it. I liked it quite a bit. Although, like anything that has momentum and is coming out regularly when you start to space that out for whatever reason and they did it they did it somewhat conscientiously but they didn't take like almost a year off yep and that's too long yep and then they became sporadic after them. because the thing is you, they always say well we're gonna take some time off you know to make sure that we're back on track and then things take over and they don't get back on track right and we've seen this with many of our favorite series from that era creator owned yeah, creator. Right, yeah, the creator owned sort of image boom and renaissance as we saw, All which those is over. Died. They just yeah, I mean, like, to, you know who finishes them? Rick Remender finishes them. Almost anybody else doesn't finish them. Southern Bastards Never isn't over. Yeah, it, uh, what was the other one that Jason Aaron did? The, um, the goddamned one with with yep. Gara. Yeah. I mean, beautiful books, and I I know that there are all sorts of real reasons, but this is always going to be the drawback of these creator owned books is that, you know, they. Are not and for some people like if you think about um uh, not phonogram but the wicked and the divine mm-hmm. you oh, know they finished that one Jamie and Kieran were making their living off of that they committed to it and they got it out regularly they did their thing and they finished it but that's because you know like Jamie wasn't doing anything else he was just doing that thing whereas some of the other ones I don't know that they can support somebody long enough in the and, middle of the saga run I switched to collected editions because I wasn't. The same thing happened with Why Last Man. I wasn't enjoying it as a single issue book, and then I think I just fell off of it. Because I liked Saga, but I didn't love it after the first like ten. I loved it in the beginning, and then it just I just I I didn't love it as much. And then as you mentioned, it just sort of you know stopped coming out regularly. I liked it a lot all the way through. I don't I never stopped reading it, but I think that one thing that did happen is that as the as they started to get more spaced out, I really enjoyed the issue, but they're pretty fast issues. Yeah. That's why I went to trades because it was like this it doesn't satisfy the issues. Yeah, it was a real quick bite that was pretty enjoyable, but it it was left you wanting more so much and it just took so long to get to more mm-hmm. that I would enjoy it when it was here, but I didn't think about it otherwise. And and may, this is a, a speculation thing. I think it got kind of popular on itself, and everybody was into it and saying how great it was. And it kind of, you know, like 
it's almost like the book didn't have to prove it anymore. Uh, and I find that, I don't know, like th- this happens sometimes, like the story starts to get into the hard part, you know, where, where, you know, introducing that's really fun. The big climax is fun. The middle part where you've got to get from A to B or C or whatever. And, you know, some of those parts take too long and some of those parts are not as interesting as the other. And that's where the real challenge of the whole thing is. And it's not a bad comic by any means, but it wasn't like the most amazing comic anymore. So am I correct in seeing that there hasn't been a new issue in two years? I, I can't remember when the last one was. I'm looking at its Wikipedia entry and it says issue 54 came out July 25th, 2018. And that Vaughn last year told Entertainment Weekly that the second half would also be 54 issues. But that was a year ago. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. And what's what's uh, what's her name doing? Fiona. Fiona Staples. I don't know. So, you That's know what's tough. a bummer about that? It's tough. I thought that this that would be one that we we made it through because it was enormously successful. It still is. It still sells a lot in trades. Yeah, and that that's even more of a head scratcher. That's like, well, why why you know like they could make a they could make a, a good living just doing that book. They could, but he could make a better living writing TV and movies. I know. I know. I get it. But also, if you've got something plotted out, you can write one comic book as a pretty part-time job. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Who knows? Who knows why? I'm not, you know. Just the point is, like, it felt a little thin in issues. I wasn't enjoying it that way. I changed the trades, and eventually, you know, I forgot. I guess I forgot to keep going. I don't even know. The real problem is I don't know where I am on the trades. And I'd, in order to find that, I'd have to dig out a bunch of stuff in storage. I don't know if that's going to happen. So I may not be able reading Saga for a while. It ends up being kind of not worth it. And, and I, I just to back up on the, on the other thing, like I know it doesn't necessarily take a lot of time to write a script out of comic book issue, especially the way that he writes them, but there is a creative factor. And if your heart's not like they, I'm guessing, you know, they kind of moved away from it because they were working on something else. And then when you lose that momentum, it's real hard to get it back, I think. I don't know. It's kind of a bummer, but you know, like it, it also a lot of those books from that era, and I don't mean to keep generalizing, but a lot of them, maybe their eyes were too big for their stomachs. Like they had this grand plan. We're going to do our 60 issues of Preacher or whatever. And it, it feels like in that environment, it doesn't work unless you're like supported by what, you know, Vertigo used to do or something like that, where those people can make actual real livings working on those things. They're making a lot of money off Saga. That's the money's not sure. an issue. They're making a ton not of money. Not with that one, but with others, I'm sure. Yeah, but I'm just saying with this one, who knows why? I'm not, I don't want to speculate on why they're not doing it or why they're just taking a two year break, but. Uh, we just both fell off it for various reasons. Two years is a long time between volumes of a book like that. Especially now. With the, like, there's just so much content in your life. that I am sure that eventually, at some point, I will get back on it once I figure out where I'm at. Or probably start from the beginning again. I just, have to, I just have to find all the trades. But I'm also, like, if this is a planned 108-issue issue epic, then maybe I'll wait till he's actually done and see to see. I don't know. It was a book we were really excited for. It was pick of the week a lot. The first couple, you know, the first year it came out, and then it just sort of got a little rote. And honestly, I don't even think about it. You know, whenever we talk about the image boom or image where image is at, we almost never mention Saga, which is yeah, probably true. the most popular book. Yeah, but I mean, I, I put that on like it's not they're not putting it in front of us anymore. Well, it's, yeah, it's been it's, it's been two years, so yeah. you know. And and like that, it wasn't it wasn't like all that frequent before that. It wasn't infrequent. They would take regularly scheduled breaks the same way like it, farmhand does and other books do yeah but like there was a year-long break which is not the same thing as a two or three month break or even a six month break i don't know i'd have to look at the publishing schedule to see what the breaks were like i just wasn't i wasn't enjoying it in issues that's why i stopped reading it in issues and i think ron did the same thing at the time but um yeah so that's what happened with saga which is a bummer where uh, you go contact at fanboy.com that's you can write in to get in the show we've been getting a lot of good email and uh you know, when this whole thing happened with comics stopping, we thought, hey, we get more time for email, but that does, that's not the case. This is always the case. Our eyes are bigger than our we stomachs. We can't shut up. I can't. That's definitely true. Hey, we got shows coming up. I uh, will have a talk split for you soon. I need to schedule that. That's just what that is. I was trying to give it a little room to breathe. We have a book explode coming up. I need to start reading on that, too. Jack Kirby's New Gods, big old edition that came out from D.C., which is going to be, I'm really looking forward to and I'm excited about and a little wary of. I'm like, it's 424 pages and it's and yeah. it's old Kirby. It might take us four years to read it. Jack was kind of uselessly verbose at that point from what I understand, but I'm going to experience it now. So I actually know what I'm talking about. We have a media explode. We were just talking about this earlier. Uh, I mean, you're listening to this on Sunday. 
probably later this week if we can help it because that's April and that's what we promised. So we're going to go for that. Yeah, I think it'll be maybe it may be the last day of the month, the 30th, but that's our plan. There you go. I was thinking about this actually earlier. Like this, this whole weird situation is throwing things in disarray. As we said before, by the time we hit December, there will be six talks blows. There will be six books blows. There will be media blows. Whether they come out exactly the months they're supposed to is is another issue. But there's a lot. You would think a lot more free time, but in many ways, there's a lot less free time. If that makes <laughs> sense. So by the end of the year, you will have your shows for sure. In the meantime, we also have some events coming up. Next Friday, Friday, May 1st, we're having a patrons-only X-Men Dark Phoenix watch party. We, since we opened up the Hangouts to everyone, we wanted to do something just for the patrons. Ron's never seen Dark Phoenix, the final uh, X-Men movie from the Fox universe. And so we're going to do a watch party hangout. We can't broadcast the film, but we're all going to sync our movies. It's on HBO Go, HBO Now. We're going to sync and hit play at the same time and watch it Friday, May 1st. The hangout will start at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. The movie won't start exactly at that time. We'll probably give people a few minutes to join. But So if you want to hang out and watch Dark Phoenix with us, that's happening May 1st. And then two weeks later, the patron hangout, which again will be open to everyone while we're all in quarantine, Saturday, May 16th at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. That's our monthly hour of nonsense. And then, and then like last time, before that, we're gonna, I'm going to host a Tiki Happy Hour with Gordon the Intern. So that'll be at Saturday the 16th at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. So if you want to hang out with us, I have a couple of drinks before the hangout starts. Come do that. It'll be fun. In the meantime, head to our That's where you can find all of our podcasts, all the ones Josh mentioned, all of our old shows. You can find out what the pick of the week is before the show comes out by liking facebook.com slash ifanboy or following at ifanboy on Twitter or ifanboycomics on Instagram where also occasionally there'll be the best week in panels if we find any during this time. There were some last week, none this week. Individually, we are at CS Kilpatrick on Instagram, at Jay Flanagan on Twitter and Instagram. Ron is at RonXO on Twitter and Instagram. And also, subscribe to our YouTube page, youtube.com slash iFanboy. That's where you can find the video shows that we are re-uploading that Josh mentioned earlier in the show. We uploaded the first episode of iFanboy Mini this week, the first two episodes of the iFanboy video show this week. You can go back and see 10 years ago and many pounds ago. <laughs> us talking about comics, so youtube.com slash ifanboy that's where you can find all of our old content there's gonna be 280 ish shows they're gonna get uploaded the next year so you'll get a lot of old content if you weren't around during that time or you've never seen those shows the minis especially get kind of wacky and fun yeah the first few would we get better is what the I'm first few like anything like the video show itself we were yeah figuring it out and then we hit our groove if i could say so I especially enjoyed the wackier ones you and I did together. I remember being in my hot little office in Queens and mm-hmm. laughing very hard. Yeah, so I, if you've never <laughs> seen them, they're fun little time capsules from the comic book world 10 years ago, but they also are, they were really fun to do, and I'm, I was bummed we stopped doing them because I had a lot of fun making them. So check those out, youtube.com slash iFanboy. Subscribe and like. Is that what they say? Like and subscribe? Yeah, we, the thing, I hate, every time somebody on YouTube is like, please like and subscribe, I'm always like, don't beg. Don't be like that. <laughs> Well, I'm telling you to subscribe. I'm not begging. Yeah. I'm saying it. Yeah. Yeah. You should do subscribe. It. Like, we should shut off comments. We should do those two things. I just enabled the newest video while we were waiting for the show to start. So there's a new one right now. I see. It's always happening. It's always working. Yeah. If you like this show, you could write a review or leave a star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever it is you do that. Keep up the word. We've said this many times, but uh, if you're on social media or whatever, and there's there's somebody, especially you know, if like somebody's just looking for some, some distraction now, like, whoever those uh, charmed individuals must be. This is the two sides of the quarantine. Like this, we have way too much time, and oh my god, there's no time. And I know which side I fall on. But <laughs> uh, you know, this is the time for that. Invite somebody to the hangout. It's funny. The guy earlier said that you know, I started listening to the show a year ago, and the thing that I always wonder is like, is that possible? Can you get into the show, or we do we have our heads so so up our own asses that that's not possible? But it feels like you should be able to jump on at any time i think the answer is both yeah i think that's true yeah i, I think the, <laughs> i think the, the content the yes. comic talking content isn't so dense that they can't do that but the things that we find funny might be like why are they keep but eventually if you stick around you don't have issues you'll just you'll just absorb it be like yeah i've been thinking about this a long time well, why are you saying that i have no idea i don't know where that started it just becomes a fact yeah yeah thanks to ron for coming and joining us on the show yep 
I think it's clear to say we're all having a lot of fun with that. Like this is like <laughs> this is like opening a cork that we just didn't know needed to be let out for a long time. I think the part of the reason why we're not doing as many emails is because I, the G.I. Joe segment's going much longer than any of us anticipated. Sure. So there's your show for the week. There you go. There's your show. I'm Connor. I'm Josh. We'll see you Stay next safe. week. Yeah. Wash your hands. You might want to watch Almost Famous. Wash your hands. You wash your hands while you're watching Almost Famous, but not the whole thing. It's certainly not the director's cut. You'll dry right out.